want to tell you the story about the Roper family. The Roper family comes into our line through my mother's side, Margaret Rice, great-grandfather, or my third great-grandfather, married Candace Roper. Her family line goes way back, and it's quite an interesting story that I want to share with you today. The story of the Roper family really comes after the Norman conquest of 1066 in England. Uh, they lived in Derbyshire, England, a beautiful countryside in the middle of England. The name Roper is derived from the old English, English word rap, which was an occupational name for a roper or a rope maker. The name has been spelled Roper, Ruper, R-O-O-P-E-R, Ruper, R-U-P-E-R, Roper, and many other ways. This is a picture of the Ryber Castle, which is in Derbyshire, England, the area where our ancestors were from. And they might have been in that castle. The earliest roper that we know about that was the most prominent was called William Roper. Um, he was born in around 1496, and he died the 4th of January, 1578. He became the High Sheriff of Kent, England. His father was John Roper, an attorney general to King Henry VIII. William Roper was a biographer who wrote a biography on Sir Thomas More in 1626. Sir Thomas More was his father-in-law, as he had married his wife Elizabeth. The movie A Man for All Seasons was about Thomas More, and William Roper was the main person in that movie. This picture is actually a picture of William Roper that was painted back in the 15th century by Younger Holbein, who was a German Renaissance painter. So he was a quite wealthy man. Here is the Roper coat of arms. They had a motto, a light to the English and a cross to the French, meaning that they would battle and, and the French were their enemies. Some of the first settlers of Rope, the Roper family that came to our country was John and Alice Roper, who arrived in 1637. Clement Roper arrived in Virginia in 1623, along with Thomas, and then Richard Roper arrived in Maryland in 1730. Our line comes through the John and Alice Roper. John Roper Sr., who is my ninth great-grandfather, was born in 1588 in New Beckenham, Norfolk, England. Here's a picture of the town and the old castle remains. He married Elizabeth in 1610 at the age of 22. He sailed to America in 1637 as part of the Great Puritan Migration, which was approximately 30 years after the Pilgrims arrived. He brought his wife and his two sons. One of his sons was John, who's my eighth great-grandfather, and he was examined on April 13, 1637 in Yarmouth, England, on his intentions of why he was coming to New England. They probably sailed on the ship the Rose. They settled in Dedham, Massachusetts, in August of 1637. Dedded had been incorporated in 1636 and it's just west of Boston and was on the frontier at the time. Here's a picture of the Fairbanks house which was built in 1636 and is still standing today. The covenants for the town were completed at a town meeting in August of 1837 and John Roper Sr. was the 46 of the 125 signers of that proclamation and he was active in town meetings. He lived in Dedham until his death in 1664. His son John Roper Jr. had married his wife in 1630 about seven years before coming to New England. They settled near his father but then moved to Lancaster, Massachusetts sometime near 1654. It was a little further out in the wilderness. There is a record there of some land grant given to him. They also set up their home and farm, and John participated in community affairs. After the death of his father, his mother also came to live with his family. However, they had some problems. There was a war called the King Philip's War, which was sometimes called the First Indian War, which was an armed conflict between the Native Amer American inhabitants of present-day New England and the English colonists and their Native American allies in 1675 to 1678. They had a first attack on Lancaster in the August of 1675, where they destroyed some bridges going on east and in back into Boston, and they killed eight people there. 
This is a color etching plate depicting Metacomet, who was the king of Mount Hope, or King Philip, as he called himself. And this was actually engraved by Paul Revere in 1772. Six months later, after the King Philip's War started, on February 10, 1675 to 76, the second Lancaster massacre was more powerful and bloody. It was in the depths of winter, and most of the col colonial troops were away in their winter quarters. A few houses in the town had been garrisoned for more protection, but the people were not very vigilant, supposing that the severity of the weather would also keep the Indians quiet until spring. There were about 150 to 280 people living in Lancaster, Massachusetts at this time. Early in the morning of February the 10th, King Philip, followed by 1,500 warriors, made an assault on Lancaster. They attacked the town in five different places. The main attack was on the house of the Reverend Mr. Rawlinson, which was the central fortified home, but it was vulnerable still on one side. At least 42 people of the town ran into this house for safety. One witness, Mrs. Rawlinson, who was later taken captive, said, Quickly, it was the dolefulest day that ever mine eyes saw. The house was defended upward to, of two hours with determined bravery. The Indians, after several unsuccessful attempts to set fire to the building, filled the cart with com combustible materials and approached the defenseless rear of the house, and it was soon enveloped in flames. The enemy watched every opportunity to shoot defenders if anyone was exposed to the window. The bullets seemed to fly like hail, she said. Soon one man was wounded and then another, and then a third. The fire from the combustibles in the cart seized on the house, and one brave man ventured out and quenched the flames. But the fire was again lighted and soon spread over the entire house. Some people inside the house were fighting for their lives, and some wallowed in their own blood. She said, I took my children, and one of my sisters took hers, to go forth and leave the house. But as soon as we came to the door and appeared, the Indians would shoot so thick at the door with bullets that rattled against the house that we were forced to give back. Thus, she says in her narrative, we were butchered by those merciless heathens, standing amazed with the blood running down our hills, unquote. Of all the people in the house, only one, Ephraim Roper, my seventh great-grandfather, escaped. The wife of Ephraim Roper was killed in attempting to escape along with her three-year-old daughter, Priscilla. It's hard to imagine the grief that Ephraim must have felt at losing his wife and daughter, but he didn't have any time to grieve, as he is listed as part of the colonial troops sent to fight the Indians. We don't know if he was wounded in these skirmishes but we do know that in May he came back to Lancaster, only to discover that his grandmother, Elizabeth Roper, had died March 24, 1676, and his father, John Roper, two days later, as they were evacuating from Lancaster to Concord, Massachusetts, possibly from an Indian ambush. So by the time the war was over, Ephraim had lost his wife, his three-year-old daughter, his grandmother, and his father. Ephraim's mother Alice never returned to Lancaster, but remarried and lived in the Charlestown area of Boston for the rest of her life. Ephraim stayed in Concord, Massachusetts, and on November 20, 1677, we see that he married a widow by the name of Hannah Brewer Goebel. Ephraim and Hannah stayed in the Concord and Sudbury area, and they had five children, two that survived, Elizabeth and Ephraim. In 1684, the government made an exemption and granted the inhabitants of Lancaster some land and help to return finally and rebuild their homes. Here is a modern site of the Rollinson Garrison in Lancaster, Massachusetts. However, in 1689, another Indian War broke out, named the King Williams War. This was between the French and the English, but it also involved the Indians in New England. On September 11, 1697, a treaty was signed that officially ended the King William's War. However, before word reached Massachusetts of the treaty, the Indians attacked Lancaster, where they killed 21 people and wounded two, and also took six captives. 
Ephraim Roper's home at that time was one of the garrison houses that offered more protection. Ephraim's ten-year-old son, also named Ephraim, was one of those that was taken captive. Ephraim and his wife Hannah and their fourteen-year-old daughter Elizabeth were three of the twenty-one that were killed in the war. Ephraim was a captive for two years until a ransom was paid to the Indians for his release. Upon young Ephraim's return, Richard Moore, who is our seventh great-grandfather and his future father-in-law, became his guardian and lived in Sudbury, Massachusetts with him. Ephraim Roper, Jr. married Thomas Moore's daughter, Sibylla Moore, on the 14th of November in 1714. They had ten children. Around 1720, Ephraim moved to Worcester, Massachusetts, and was active in the community government and, and was a large landowner. He was accidentally killed in the woods near his home in 1730. His youngest child was born six months after his death. His wife died a year later. The children's grandfather, Richard Moore, as well as other close family and friends, assumed the guardianship for the ten children. There were three generations of Ephraim Ropers. Ephraim Roper III, our fifth great-grandfather, lived from 1716 through 1793 and saw the birth of our nation. He and his wife, Michael Houghton, had ten sons and one daughter. At the beginning of the Revolutionary War, seven sons were old enough to shoulder a musket and three others soon would be. Thus the family tradition was that all ten of his sons served in the Revolutionary War. Father Ephraim was 58 years old at the start of the war and never served. Here is the Ephraim Roper homestead in Sterling, Massachusetts that was built during the Revolutionary War. Here is a picture of the grave of Ephraim Roper III, who I said lived from 1716 to 1793. It's interesting on him, his tombstone it is written, Friends and physicians could not save my mortal body from the grave, nor can the grave confine me here when Christ shall bid me to appear. Ephraim's seventh son, Ephraim, who was the fourth, was the first to serve in the Revolutionary Army and was on the Lexington Alarm Roll in 19th of April, 1775. After Lexington... He enlisted in the regular army and served until 1780 when he died at Crown Point, New York, presumably of smallpox, but he might have been a, a prisoner to the British as that was a British camp at that time. Ephraim and Michael were very religious, as noted by the biblical names of their sons. They had Benjamin, Manasseh, Silas, Asa, Nathaniel, Enoch, Enos, John, Sylvester, and Joseph who is my fourth great-grandfather. Their daughter was named Lucy. Besides seeing action in Lexington, several sons served near the Hudson River to stop Benedict Arnold, and in New Jersey, serving under General Gates. They also served at Ticonderoga, Claverack, and West Point, and some against General Clinton's invasion of Rhode Island. All of them survived except for the one son, but some had lifelong illnesses and injuries due to their service. Joseph Roper was my relative from that family. In 1830, Joseph and his wife Ruth moved to the wilderness area of Gibson, Susquehanna County, Pennsylvania. Yes, they were there at the time that Joseph probably left Susquehanna County. There with their daughter Candace Roper, who had married Daniel Woodrice, Daniel had gone a year earlier and had built a home and a sawmill. It took the family six weeks to travel from Massachusetts to the wilderness of Susquehanna County, Pennsylvania, a distance of only 300 miles. They were very industrious. They were coopers, which built barrels. They made furniture. They did milling and wagon making. The women learned to braid at straw hats. In 1831, Daniel Woodrice suddenly died, but Candace kept her three sons together and raised them in this wilderness home. This is a sterling silver napkin ring that belonged to Candace Roper that is now in the possession of me, Linda Harper, and I treasure that that I have something from her. I hope you've enjoyed this story of the Roper line and can be proud of the role that they played in the 
in the birth of our nation.